Assalamu alaikum and good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank INSEAD for extending this invitation to the World Bank Group. It's a great privilege for us to come and present uh, a report that we are working on. The report will be finalized by the end of the year and it will then be widely disseminated and we'll be in a position to discuss the detailed findings of that report then. Um, so therefore, today my presentation is more about what the report tries to do rather than go too much into the details of the findings. Uh, the World Bank Group, as you know, works in almost 200 countries and we have been in this business for about 70 years. We work across a wide range of topics, but the part of the World Bank Group that I'm involved in is called the Trade and Competitiveness Global Practice. And those two words, trade and competitiveness, mean a lot, as you know. So we all know that with globalization, tremendous opportunities are opening up for countries at different stages of development to take advantage of the huge markets that the global economy offers, to take advantage of the technological developments that's happening all over the world, and take advantage of the connectedness. Now, as you know, one of the major phenomena now are the emergence of global value chains. The iPhone that you have in your pockets or the laptops that you use, they are not manufactured in just one or two countries anymore. It could be 10, it could be 20, it could be 30 different countries where the parts are produced and then they are assembled to make this one product. And that means 20, 30 countries across the development spectrum, across income groups, can have a share, can have a participation in that global value chain. And that is the opportunity that the global economy is, is uh, throwing in front of us, and therefore trade creates these great opportunities. But in order to take advantage of that, competitiveness is important. The firms in each of our countries will have to be competitive to take advantage of that. I come from Bangladesh, which is of course quite different from the UAE or most countries in the, in the MENA region. Uh, we have not been endowed with natural resources. Nature, in fact, as you know, had often been very unkind to Bangladesh. But we are now the second largest garment manufacturer, garment exporter in the world. We have overtaken much larger countries, and it is only China which is ahead of us. And even on one account, we have even bitten China recently. In per capita terms, Bangladesh's garment exports are greater than even that of China. So China's huge garment exports are also because of the huge population they have. How did a country which is not endowed with natural resources, which even now doesn't have the perfect investment climate, there are all kinds of problems in the investment climate, but what is it that made, helped us make this breakthrough and take advantage of the opportunities that globalization afforded to us? The answer, in my opinion, is that conditions were created for the entrepreneurial talents of many, many Bangladeshis, and these talents were very latent, because we didn't have a very broad business class in Bangladesh 30 years ago when government started. But conditions were created so that it was not just a few large companies, but lots and lots of small and medium companies which came up. Some of them have become very large now. But this very democratic set of opportunities meant that the latent entrepreneurial talent that Bangladesh has had was, was unleashed and was taken advantage of. And today we heard a very profound statement, I think Dr. Ali was quoting the Crown Prince who said that here the government treats every citizen as a resource. And one of the qualities many citizens, if not all, have is the entrepreneurial talent. And that's what happened in my country and that can happen in any country. So the question is, and that brings us to the presentation. Can we have a policy framework that unleashes broad-based entrepreneurial potential? So we are posing this question because in many countries, including in the MENA region, maybe not in the UAE, but certainly in the MENA region, there was this problem. The problem of policies being driven by privileges, giving privileges to a few large companies which may be politically connected to the governments. In some cases, it may not be a question of political connectedness. It could be a part of development strategy that we want to favor large companies. 
In fact, Korea in the 60s had a strategy of favoring large companies, whereas Taiwan had a different strategy. Both of them did extremely well in terms of export-oriented growth, but initially with different strategies. But even in Korea, there was a great deal of discipline. When certain privileges were given, there were conditions attached to it. Companies had to deliver on export, companies had to deliver on technological upgradation, and if they failed to deliver, the privileges were taken away fairly ruthlessly by the government. So what I'm saying is that privilege is not always related to collusion between government and the private sector. It doesn't always mean that the private sector has more power than the government. It can arise for many reasons, but if it does, then you may end up with a policy framework which doesn't quite create conditions for broad-based entrepreneurial growth. And I think here we know certainly in the UAE, the transition that you're trying to make from resource-based development to knowledge-based development, the emphasis that you are giving for entrepreneurship development, I think uh, is considering that same principle. There are widespread entrepreneurial talents in the country. What kind of a policy system can we have which unleashes that? But before that, let's, let's go back to the subject of how the policy regimes in some countries in this region did not have those characteristics. In 2009, the World Bank published a report called From Privilege to Competition, and the title says all. How can we move from a regime which is privilege-driven to a regime which emphasizes competition? And that showed that in many countries in the region, a few politically connected firms tilt the playing field in their favor by capturing processes of policy formulation and implementation. After the Arab Spring, when more data was available, in 2013 and 2014, a couple of very in-depth studies were done, and these are all in the public domain, one for Tunisia and one for Egypt, where very detailed data was collected to show how policy capture was working. And more recently, last year, the World Bank published another report, Jobs or Privileges? Again, the same question. What is the objective of the policy regime? Is it to create privileges for a few or jobs for many? This brings me to what Dean Mayhoff said at the beginning. How can we align the objectives of business with the objectives of society? And the objectives of most societies is to create good jobs. And the role of public policy is to make sure that while business pursues profit, as they of course should, how is that aligned with the society's objective? And this report showed that when you have a policy regime which gives privileges to a few large companies, it creates a huge cost advantage for those com companies. Now, if I have a company, and for me, costs have been reduced artificially because I've been given many privileges, I would not have the incentive to compete and reduce my costs. And others are so far behind, they're so disadvantaged, they don't feel any incentive to try and be productive and catch up, because catch up is going to be very, very difficult. So a privilege-ridden policy system is not a good one if our objective is to enhance productivity and make our firms competitive. So three important questions. How can economic policy in the MENA region be made more privilege-resistant? Where can one start? What operational interventions are feasible? because at the end of the day, we want practical policies. But if we start small and the problem is big, is it possible that small changes accumulate over time, build up upon itself, so one change leads to more and you have a major change? That's a question that we're also going to pose. So this is the study that uh, was referred to. This is a study that hopefully we'll finish by the end of the year and be able to present more detailed findings. But the critical question that we are asking is the following. In different policy areas, and I'll give examples of some of those in a moment, what are the good governance features that can be instilled in both policies and public institutions so that they are shielded from these problems of capture or discretion or arbitrary implementation? Uh, and so uh, posing that same question, we are applying this motto, what gets measured gets done. Many of you have heard, maybe all of you have heard about the doing business indicators of the World Bank Group. 
The next report is about to be published uh, later this week. And this has indeed resulted in a tremendous drive all over the world to improve rankings on the doing business. But what is, why is it so? Because what was measured, that gets done. When things are measured, when a problem or a deficiency is measured, there's an incentive to work on it. And that's what we try to do here. We take different policy areas and we'll systematically try to benchmark countries on those policy areas related to the problem that I mentioned. So we are going to prepare, or we have actually, we're going to present a checklist of good governance policy features in different policy areas. And we are benchmarking eight MENA countries. The countries you can see here, uh, except for Oman, we don't have a GCC country, but this analysis can be um, uh, carried out for other countries should there be an interest in that. Uh, right now we have uh, in uh, countries like Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Egypt, and then there's Kuwait, Lebanon, Oman, and, and Jordan. So what we are doing here, and this is important, and this principle applies irrespective of whether the problem of privilege is important to your countries or not. The need to take a very granular look at policy. And we'll give you examples of what that granular look means. So it's not enough to say, okay, we have a very good foreign investment policy, we have a very good competition policy. What is that policy actually? Can we unbundle it? And then when we unbundle it, we will see that maybe there are problems, even though overall the policy regime looks good, maybe there are areas where improvements are needed. So a granular look at the policy framework. Understanding the multiple forms of distortions. So distortions creep into a policy framework in many, many forms. And just a few examples. For example, there could be regulatory barriers to entry, which means incumbents, businesses which are already in that business get an undue advantage. And there may be somebody with a very bright idea, somebody who is potentially very competitive cannot enter that industry. So here these are outright barriers, but sometimes the barriers can also be very subtle and may not always be apparent, but they may be enough to discourage new entrants to come in. If the regulatory environment is complex, and if officials have a lot of power to apply them discretionary, in a discretionary manner, then companies need to spend a lot of time, and maybe it, it will have resonance with many of you, in developing non-productive skills like getting connections to government officials. Time which could have been spent in thinking about how to improve productivity. Sometimes in some countries, there is a collusion between business and government so that the regulatory apparatus is actually abused to create problems for competitors. So tax inspectors may be sent to inspect your competitors and harass them. So again, if there are problems in the regulatory environment which allows that discretion to happen, that can also be bad for competitiveness. I won't go into the details of everything, but just to recognize that there are multiple forms of distortions. And this is important, recognizing the difference between policy on paper and how it is implemented on the ground. Governments are often uh, happy that they have enacted a new law or uh, have adopted a new policy, and then they are very unhappy when they don't see the response from businesses. But when you talk to businesses, they would say, okay, but we don't feel the impact of the policy. How can we respond? How can we invest? How can we create jobs? This gap between de jure policies, policies on paper, and de facto implementation on the ground is a pervasive problem all over the world, both in developed and developing countries. For example, you may uh, adopt a competition law, you may establish a competition authority, but unless the things that are mentioned in the uh, red boxes uh, are there, unless there are ways in which the competition law can be effectively enforced, unless you can prevent undue interference in the uh, competition authority's business, if there is no due process and transparency, if the authority doesn't have a sustainable source of funding, then the effectiveness of the authority can be undermined. So having a policy, a law, an authority is not enough. So this gap between policy on paper and policy on the ground is important. And, and that's a point. Even if privilege is not a problem, 
this implementation gap could be a problem even when you have other sound policies in place. So in this study, we looked at a number of areas, a couple of regulatory areas, customs and trade policy and business regulation, four what we call active support policies, policies which try to improve the access to finance, investment incentives, access to land, public procurement. We also talk about competition, because if you have problems in those policy areas, you end up with a non-competitive uh, marketplace, and then it behooves on competition policy to take care of that problem. But then, as I just said, if the competition policy is not effective, then those problems created in other policy areas, those non-competition problems will not be addressed. If you have problems in the policy, um, in different policy areas, often the source is a policy formation process itself. If the process through which policies were formulated is not of a good quality, if stakeholders such as businesses are not consulted, if evidence is not brought to bear when you're formulating a new regulation, if you have not thought about the entire impact of a regulation, impact on the government's capacity to enforce, the impact on the business's capacity to comply, if these impact assessments are not done, there's a risk that the regulations that you end up with are not designed properly. So the process through which policies are formulated, regulations are designed, is very, very important. And finally, underpinning all of this are the public accountability mechanisms. Are there conflict of interest restrictions? Are government officials, public functionaries uh, required to disclose their financial interests? Is there a right to information? Because that ultimately gives the underpinnings of everything else that we are talking about. So, so for all these areas, what we have done is we have identified very specific features which we think can help make policy regimes sound, robust, privilege resistant, and conducive to competitiveness. And I won't go through all the questions, but, but please look at the granularity. For example, business regulations. You need a construction permit. There are official uh, requirements. Are there also unofficial requirements, which somehow uh, are being asked for by government officials? Let's talk about investment incentives. When investment incentives are granted, is there a good criteria, or is it given randomly? If there's a good criteria, is that public? Do people know about it? When land is allocated to the private sector, is it through auctions and tenders, or again, is it done randomly? Is it done after a cost-benefit plan has, assessment has been carried out? So these are very granular features, but this is where the discipline comes in. This is where the governance comes in. Similarly, for public procurement, uh, is the public opening of tenders, does it follow a defined and regulatory procedures, for example? Are records of the uh, procedures of bid opening, are those maintained? And even better, are they made public? Again, these are very specific features uh, which make decision-making rule-based. The second set of questions are about transparency. Let's take the case of investment incentives again. Does governments maintain a good database on what incentives have been given, how much, to who? Number one. You may be surprised to hear that in many countries, there isn't a single database in government where this data exists. So the Ministry of Trade may have given some incentives, the Ministry of Industry may have given some incentives, some other ministry may have given some incentives, and the finance minister often scratches his or her head saying, oh, but I have no clue. There's, uh, the, everybody seems to be giving incentives, but there's no single database which tells me how, many, how much has been given in incentives, let's say, last year. If such a database exists, is it actually made transparent? Because if it's made transparent, Everyone knows who is getting what, and questions can then be asked. The same thing can be asked about allocation of public land, about public procurement, business regulations, are the requirements very widely known, are they very transparent? So transparency is another big issue. Again, one can ask very granular, precise questions, and then if the answers suggest that no, there are deficiencies, the operational implications are very clear. This is not an abstract exercise. So if a database doesn't exist, 
an operational intervention could be, can we put together data? Can we bring the different agencies giving incentives together and surely they have some records, let's bring the records together and create the database. So fairly operational uh, implications that come. Competition policy, as I said, those four red boxes, here are some details about what kind of questions you can ask to see whether your competition policy framework is actually effective in practice. So for example, does the competition authority have the authority to comment on different policies that the government takes? Because it's not just competition policy. Your incentives policy may have a competition dimension. Your industrial policy may have a competition dimension. Your fiscal policy may have a competition dimension. One of the roles that a very good competition agency performs is the advocacy role. So can, do they have the authority to comment on the competition implications of policies that different parts of the government are adopting? That's an example of whether the authority can be effective or not. Is it an independent body? Is it too much dependent on government ministries for funding? How is the membership of the board decided? Is there a regular uh, a pattern of uh, appointments? If dismissal happens, is there a clear criteria? Or is it that government has the right to dismiss some member of the competition authority if that person is asking too many difficult questions? So these are important questions which determine whether the competition authority is actually effective in practice. These determine whether there is a gap between policy on paper and implementation on the ground, or whether implementation is actually being quite effective. So these are the kind of questions. When the report comes out, you will see very detailed questionnaires like this for all the policy areas that we have looked at. And you could also use that in your own countries uh, in the policy area that you are interested in, or across all the policy areas, ask those questions, have discussions in the country on what could be the score of the country on each of these dimensions. And if you see that there are weaknesses, then together you can come up with solutions to address them. So as I said, we have covered only eight countries, and even for those countries, there is scope to do more in-depth work, but certainly for the other countries, uh, these questions can be asked in order to improve the quality of the policy regime. Some very quick examples, so investment incentives. Just one dimension of that. One interesting thing we saw is that the quality of the policy in these eight countries may not be very bad. They have, they have, certain, uh, they have a policy in place, for example, that we will give incentives uh, to encourage investment. But some of the good provisions may not be there. For example, in many countries, they don't have a provision for periodic assessments of the incentive regime. The incentive that we are giving with certain objective, building uh, competitiveness, building a knowledge economy, for example, or uh, expanding exports, is it really happening? Are the incentives really leading to the results that we wanted? These kind of assessments, even the policy doesn't say that we should regularly have these assessments. So that's why you will see things like review transparency. The policy often doesn't say that let's publish data on the incentives that have been given. So you have a policy, but the policy doesn't have good practice. That's why the second bar, the score is low. But more importantly, even if the policy has these provisions, in practice they are not being followed. And that's the third uh, bar, which is even low brings us back to that same question, the gap between policy on paper and policy implementation on the ground. Similarly, on competition law, in this, well, of the eight countries, Lebanon does not have a competition law. Other countries do. But for example, the competition agency may not be fully staffed. The procedural framework uh, may not be fully developed. Uh, some have the competition law and the agency, but have not yet investigated any in case the cases. And in many, many countries where there is a competition law, it doesn't apply to all sectors or all agents of the economy. So some actors are actually uh, exempted from the purview of the competition authority and the competition law, which also dilutes the effectiveness of, of the agency. Uh, this is once more on the independence. And once again, in many of these countries, 
the procedures to appoint uh, members of the competition agency, the, uh, the arrangements for funding, all of that leave a lot of scope still for improvement in terms of enhancing the independence of the authorities. The diagram there is quite telling. Uh, ideally, you would like a cooling off period for people who are appointed as members so that conflicts of interest are not there. But with one exception, there is no provision for a cooling off period in the competition laws and policies of most of the countries that, that we studied. The final example, this is from a cross-country uh, indicator exercise that another part of the bank group has done on the extent to which governments consult with stakeholders and the extent to which uh, they share drafts of regulations coming up and the extent to which new regulations are based on evidence. And as you can see, the, for the MENA countries, at least the ones which we covered, the scores are actually quite low compared to, let's say, some European countries. So the scope to engage stakeholders in the policy formation process, I think there's still a lot of scope. So these are just samplings of the findings. There will be more detailed findings when the report comes out, but I just wanted to give a flavor uh, of that. So, so all this is measurement, coming to action now. And just one slide, which addresses the question I posed at the beginning. Let's say we start with some feasible operational interventions. Let's say we have a database on investment incentives. Not a very difficult thing to do if you have the will to do it. Can small changes accumulate over time and create a big change? It's possible. And here it's a hypothetical example. Let's say in one government they decide that we are going to improve the way the allocation of public lands is carried out. And what we will do, we will introduce certain features which bring rule-based decision-making in the allocation of public land. And I was giving some examples in the past, in, 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 uh, uh, in a previous slide on how that can happen. Let's say we just do that. And the benefits of that are apparent to both the government and businesses that may create some momentum for further reforms. And that could go horizontally so, for example, in uh, public procurement, the authorities may decide to follow the same policy, adopt the same policy features and make it more rule-based. And then maybe at some stage, those dealing with investment incentives may do it. So there's a second round reform, a third round reform across policy areas. Sometimes it may happen in the same policy area. So the agencies responsible for allocation of public land, after having introduced rule-based decision makings, may then be emboldened to go more transparent, go more public, and therefore um, go for stakeholder consultation, go for public information sharing. So a vertical uh, ripple effect may come. So the message is that one can start with in an operationally practical way, but if we have this kind of picture in mind, that over time you want the ripple effects to be created, whether horizontally or vertically, then you may be able to make a big change in the policy regime. So finally, as I said, the report is going to be uh, finalized soon, and we hope to generate discussion not only in the eight countries that are covered, but countries such as the UAE and other countries uh, on, on the relevance of those findings. Uh, we are going in-depth into a couple of countries. Uh, Morocco and Lebanon has already shown interest, so there will be in-depth assessments there. Uh, the World Bank Group always stands ready to help governments who want to introduce these uh, reforms that I was talking about. We are doing it in many countries, and we provide uh, assistance in various forms. And finally, and I think this is very relevant for this gathering, this agenda cannot gain momentum unless the business is behind it. So the business sector has a great role to play to join hands with government in making this agenda, the agenda of making the policy regimes conducive to unleashing the broad-based entrepreneurial potential which surely exists to a large extent in this region. Business has a role to work with government to improve public governance. So thank you very much for your attention. And that's the end of my question. One question that comes to mind right away, we're here in Abu Dhabi.
Uh, you analyzed eight MENA countries with a lot of conclusions, interesting insights, but how is it relevant here for the region or specifically for UAE? Yeah. So, uh, as we all know, in the UAE, uh, as you're trying to diversify your economy and you're emphasizing the role of the knowledge economy, uh, and you're trying to unleash the entrepreneurial uh, potential uh, of, the, of the country uh, and adopting policies, including what we call direct support policies, such as whether it's incubators, industrial estates, uh, support to um, uh, high-end research, all of that. But at the end of the day, it will be the policy regime, the kind of policies that we are talking about, and there are other policy areas as well. Uh, the effectiveness of those policy regimes in creating the incentives to improve productivity, take advantage of the other uh, support that the government is giving, the ability of that policy regime to create the incentives is important. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that past development efforts may have relied a bit on large companies, and you now want to move away from reliance on just large companies to fostering a lot of small and medium enterprise growth, it is possible that elements of this, uh, these privileges may have crept in. So one good thing would be to have a test. Maybe the policy regime is not privilege uh, afflicted at all, but it may be good to go take that granular approach, look at various policy areas and see, do we still have vulnerabilities through which the, the, the drive for privilege may creep in? So that, that could be a good test. But more generally, the principles of looking at policy regimes in a granular manner and be very cognizant of the possible gap between policies on paper and policies implemented on the ground. This is something governments often lose sight of. But that discipline applies to any policy that you take. So I think those principles would be very, very relevant to the UAE. Okay, well, um, I think it's very interesting that you go into really into deep analysis of various impediments to, you know, to business creation, to entrepreneurship. So, you know, we know that there are bottlenecks. So there are some institutions that are bigger bottlenecks than others. Uh, to repeat the question from the last panel, if you had to change one thing, and if you think that one thing is important in these eight MENA countries or UAE, yeah, but I think the analysis for the eight million countries, what would it be if you had this magic wand and you say, you know, this okay. is, and I know education is very important, you know, we're here at business school, so besides education, what else? Well, I mean, there are different levels, apart from the fact that I'm always hesitant to talk about magic wands. Uh, I, I may, if you permit me, I may just rephrase it a bit differently, which is, where can one sort of start by focusing, let's say, in the next two, three years, uh, and then hope that that leads to a lot of ripple effects that I was mentioning. So in terms of policy regimes, rule-based decision-making, I think, would be a very important area to start focusing on, and evidence-based decision-making. So if you talk, let's say, about promoting the knowledge economy and promoting research and development because we believe that that would help companies become more competitive. You have that program. First, the, the allocation of the support, whatever support is being given for research and development. Do you have clear rules and regulations? Do you have a clear criteria? And is the criteria transparent, number one. Number two, from time to time, there should be a provision to look at the effectiveness of that policy. Is that policy really leading to the results that you expect? Which also means that early on you have clearly identified the theory of change. That why should this fiscal support, for example, for research and development, how is, going to, how is this ultimately going to work its way out at the enterprise level and lead to improved productivity? The theory of change, if that's clear, and if indicators have been identified, later you can collect data and measure the effectiveness. Uh, I just want to say in Singapore, I once read that the clue to their success were three things for the government. Think ahead, which you're doing here in this country. Think across, so it's not just one issue, but actually many issues. And that's why I was saying I'm also hesitant to pinpoint to one issue, there's a need to think across. And finally, think again.
again and again. Maybe the direction you have started on may not be exactly the right direction. Maybe you have to go this way. Think again. I think that's wonderful. We have very little time, so I'll open it to, to, for questions to the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand. I think that there is somebody there. Microphone, please. But I think that uh, the most difficult thing, and when I teach, when I talk about economic growth, and we say you know, institutions are important, we recognize that there is not a single poor country that has good quality institutions, and there is not a single rich country that has bad quality institutions. So you have to have the good quality institutions to be a rich country. However, every government understands this, and the theory of change that you're describing here is something that is very important because everybody asks, so how do you start this change? Mm -hmm. How do you actually implement this? Why do governments don't do these things? So, question. My name is Bolek Stavitsky, and I work for the uh, Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund. I've got a question about the uh, removal of privileges and uh, the encouragement of competition. When we look at different uh, free trade agreements, we know that in some places they may result in uh, thousands of jobs lost, like in the US, for example, when we look at NAFTA. Now, it ultimately, it will have political repercussions as we see today in the upcoming election in the, in the US. And indeed, it can also lead to a backlash when it comes to free trade and the encouragement of, uh, of competition. So what, what would you say, what do you think went wrong? Because clearly, free trade and competition, increased competition, can easily lead to backlash and, and to, to uh, political turmoil. Thank you. Well, indeed, I mean... Um one set of problems is I mean, any, any transformation, and free trade of course leads to transformation, is going to be painful. Uh, and the question is whether these possible implications of free trade were A, thought of in advance, thinking ahead, whether the implications which cut across many parts of society were clearly understood, think across, and as policies were adopted to deal with this uh, impact, it could be some social protection policy, it could be some support to enterprises, which may not have been effective. So did people think again and assess the, uh, the effectiveness of the policies which were taken, the programs which were taken to mitigate the distributional implications of these policies? Uh, the free trade policies. So I think there were failures in all of these areas and that's why we now see uh, this kind of reaction. If I come back to the Bangladesh experience, one reason why poverty has gone down considerably in the country in the last 10 years is because the way Bangladesh took advantage of free trade was through labor intensive garment growth. It was labor intensive, so people from the poorer segments of society got an opportunity to participate in that. Uh, it may not have happened purely by design, but certainly through an iterative process, government always reacted to, to any threat to the industry because they realized the distributional implications of the industry. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Unfortunately, we're out of time and we're behind schedule, but I think that uh, the report sounds very interesting. I hope that you know, beyond the report for the eight million countries, we'll be able to do similar, you'll be able to do similar analysis for other countries so that they can accelerate their institutional reform and the process of growth. Thank you very much.